الحمد لله احمده واستعينه واستديه واستغفره وامن به جل ولا ولا اكبره واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله الصلاه بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولا كره المشركون all praise belongs to Allah we praise him we seek his help his assistance and his guidance we believe in him and do not disbelieve in him i bear witness that there is no god but Allah and muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a servant and messenger Allah said him that is Muhammad with Deen al-Haq the religion the way the methodology of truth in this way of life known as Islam will rise to its proper position in this world whether the mushriks like it or not <clears throat> So today uh what did we say the title caught in the headlights of history that's right this uh discussion today caught in the headlights of history have a lot to do with uh as a concept in in Islam called uh tazkiyah bil nafs that is the purification of the nafs and anybody that wants to participate and the let's call it the leadership or a serious role in Islam and its development <clears throat> should go through the process uh of tazkiyah bil nafs that is the purification of the self but today we want to deal a little bit with tazkiyah of goal setting most people as they mature and they learn the process of uh, evolution revolution uh ascending to a higher level realize that they should go through the process of goal setting setting goals where do we want to go what's the time limit that we want to set for getting there all of those type of things so tazkiyah and goal setting means that uh, there's a serious thing about goal setting but very few people go through the process of purifying beforehand not only their goal setting the the goal setting process in your mind but the goal setting process that you go through of reaching your goal and it seems like a lot this what all the things that happen with us you might wonder how all of this happens with such regularity such consistency and nobody gets diverted that much is that thing that tazkiya not only tazkiya of nafs because if your nafs is not uh, in check things happen and you fly off the handle uh things happen or you get depressed things happen and you get sad you get disappointed all of those things are possible because those are human experiences now the higher le- the higher the level that you go or you attain in spiritual development the less those things affect you in fact one of the 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 avenues that we've used uh we talked about uh post traumatic growth instead of post traumatic syndrome and all that that means if you have a lot of uh, act, 
activities, a lot of, you go through a war, you go through uh, certain environmental realities that may call, cause depression and upset. Uh, you can go through this part. All the brothers that you was there for Agent Orange and and they're dying out nowadays and all that. Um, the Vietnam War, it produced a lot of that uh, post-traumatic stress. But by the time this began to happen to us and our generation, we had forgot about World War One and World War Two. In those days, they call it shell shock. When uh, you know people got bombarded so much and they went through so much trauma on the battlefield, some people can't take all of that stuff. And what they used to call it in World War One and parts of World War Two was shell shocked. All of those artillery boom, and you especially in World War One when they were in these trenches. And they had to endure all of that bombing, all of that period. Then you had to go over the top and go out and get mowed down by these new weapons, machine guns, poison gas. See, the World War I was the first time they used all of that semi-modern weaponry. Oh, my goodness. Well, it had always been... One thing about warfare, it's always been organized and mechanized. So if you would have had a, during the time of Genghis Khan and during the time of those other people, you know, uh, the Roman Empire, they would lose 300,000 people in a battle. Yeah, I, I, in fact, I, I remember... Uh, listening to or reviewing a study about Attila the Hun. And in one of his battles, he lost 300,000 people. That's kind of shocking. I mean, look, it's that's a little... You know, even today, they uh, they when you had a battle... During the Civil War, Gettysburg was one of the biggest that they had. They lost 50,000 people. That was huge. And during the Civil War, they would lose 20,000 or 15,000 in a battle. And they, 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 for the United States, the Civil War was the highest level of death they had. Because, see, it was on our territory. It was against each other. And artillery had just developed. They had just developed the rifle instead of the musket. You know, the old musket, the bullet would come, voo, 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 and then it might hit you if there was enough of you standing close enough. But by then, the rifle was, they, they had, that boy had a smooth, I mean, a, a ring bore, and that bullet, just like throwing a football, you got if you don't throw it with spin on it, what it do? It wobbles. Yeah. And that bullet, that bullet was the rifling of the barrel, which was a big uh, evolution in musketry. The old barrels were smooth, and they just had a ball. And when the bullet came out, it woo. Ooh, ooh. You know, that's the way it came. And you would be lucky if you hit something. If you did, you was happy. But that rifle, during the 1820s or 30s, they started rifling that barrel. Well, when the bullet would spin, and that boy goes direct to the target. Hey, now imagine in World War I, whether it's in ships or whether it's on land, you got now these big, highly mechanized 
artillery, you know, that'll shoot 20 miles, 25 miles, some even further than that. Uh, it would probably have to be World War II, but but they have in both of them they had where you uh, you're gonna shoot so far that you have to uh, no the artillery technically advanced between 1920 or 1918 and 19. 38, 20 years later when the World War II begins, technically. But it hadn't advanced that much. So World War I effect, not to change the subject, but uh, if you saw pictures of those big battleships, the big battleships in World War I, they had... uh, such huge guns that they all, always the, 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 to to look out over the ocean. They used to have the crows, and that's where you get up there, climb up, and you could see way out because of what the Earth's curvature. Okay, by World War One, they had to take that into account too. The Earth, for that big artillery. Now you got to remember. Those guns were um, just so imagine. Well, if you're going to hit a target 20 miles away, you got to be pretty good. And they was they had gotten, you know, in warfare they get pretty good. And so to hit a spot 20 miles away sound like a big deal for me and you, but for them. They got machinery, measurement technology. They got, uh, see a lot of people don't know, like they used to see in cannons loaded by men and by hand and what have you. But those big shot battleships, they were loaded by machinery. They had to bring the, push it and bring up the, 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 shell and the casing and then then it pushes it all together. It was all automatic. In those days, the days of putting a cannonball in there was long, long gone. So, and of course we saw all uh, you were very high up because of the curvature of the earth. On the ship, in the old days, you had to climb up the mast. The guy way up there was the one, although they had a binoculars down there, but they, the one up there was the one given the, the real where we are and what uh, what's out there. Why? Because of the curvature of the earth, like you say. And the earth is... 24,800 and some thousand square miles. Let's call it 25,000. So uh, that's uh, uh, circumference. The radius going three, straight through is only 7,000 something. Or other. So they had to be good. And the one thing that leads technology historically and nowadays is always warfare. Think about it. Look at the movies or the machinery from the American experience and that. Say from World War I uh, to World War II. It's not, that's only 20 years. But if you look at the weaponry, the machinery, and everything, some of the stuff that they had during World War I, it was all improved. The machine guns were improved. 
the caliber of the machine guns was improved. The airplane that they used to fly for reconnaissance in World War I, and they would have a pistol. The, the guys on the different teams, they would wave at each other in the first part of World War I. But by the end of World War I, they have machine guns. And they're having dog fights, you know, and stuff like that. Okay. By World War II, they not only, all the machine guns are automatic. When you push that button in the plane, the machine gun automatically fires and it takes pictures and everything else. That's where all of those war films come from. You see, they, are, they automatically had, soon as, because they had to study what they're doing. You know, so they watched. And then by the end of World War II, you went from World War I-ish type of uh, environment to the atomic bomb. Right. Yeah. yeah, because they had no atomic bomb before 1939, 1940, 1941. And if you look at the aircraft, if you look at uh, early aircraft in World War II, you start off with B-25s and B-26s and what have you. By the end, you have the B-29. That boy flies high. It has new, all new types of machinery on it and what have you. And it was progress. It was so much different between four years earlier at the beginning of World War II. So the wars increased things in medicine and technology. In World War I, World War II, you see when they got a stretcher, they're carrying a guy, they always got uh, some uh, blood dripping. It's not blood, it's plasma, you know, because the plasma will fill up until you can get your blood type. They don't know what your blood type is right there. They don't even have, so they give you plasma. But that plasma fills up the space uh, and feeds your body enough oxygen. You know, plasma has the same make up of blood, I mean it oxygen and all of that. So on battles uh in the early early years if you got hit you usually died. Especially one of the deadliest battles the most people lost in American battles was not all this World War I, World War II, and all that. Mm -mm. Not even Vietnam. Korea, they only lost uh, 57,000. Vietnam, they only lost 58,000 people in Vietnam. You know why? Medicine. Had, uh, they could, they were not like now. Like, like now, you see all the people now get wounded in battle. They come back walking on stilts and all kind of stuff. If you don't die on the spot and they get you back to medevac you, they're going to push stuff in you, suck stuff out of you, and they'll keep you alive. The quality of life is, is you know, is determined by different people or the person, but you don't die like when you used to get hit on the battlefield, you got gangrene going to set in. You got uh, you bleed to death. If you if you notice World War, the Civil War, I don't know if you watched any of the old movies. They had a lot of amputees. That was big. No, that was big. That, that was big. Oh, yeah. You anesthetic. Huh? <laughs> they had a little heroin in those days, uh, morphine. They had a little heroin. But no, no, do you stick a stick? That was true. They'd stick a stick a bone in your mouth, 
and you bit that boy and they cut off your body parts. I mean, you know, and then when they cut your arm off up here, they stuck a hot iron on that boy. Good God Almighty, if you don't die from the bullet, the operation will kill you. I mean, can you imagine how brutal? And then they would just have a wagon full of arm body. Because if you got hit, you had to cut that part off because it's going to, they didn't, that's before antibiotics and all of that. Now the stuff that you get hit with, uh, shoot, you just take a couple of antibiotics and all of that, and almost you keep running. Uh, you know, I'm just doing like they do on the movie, but they be lying a little. You know, John Wayne, them, he could get shot with a 45 and he could get. Uh, they'd pull the bullet out and he'd ride in a wagon for about two days. You know, things are not healing. You know, when you know a little bit about medicine, you know that, of course, we know that's not possible anyway. Now, they didn't, anesthetic, you ever watch them old westerns? They would take some alcohol, whiskey. Pour it on the thing because they did find out that whiskey was uh, al- alcohol and it would, uh, and then they drank a little, little whiskey and poured the rest on the, uh, you know, I mean, but it's a long way away from reality. The point is about post traumatic stress and post traumatic syndrome and post traumatic growth. If people analyze what we go through around here, even now when we're cruising, they would have a psychological post-traumatic stroke. The people would, uh, you know, because things involve your family, all your friends, you don't trust anybody anymore, you don't love anybody anymore, and uh, they steal your money, and they wreck everything like now even on the resting period we got one two three cars out there they all work good the day before they work real good and you know usually they would they would uh, anyway but that didn't happen so much that uh, we're used to it right? we'll just park them out there until something happened and we'll wait a while and but and, de- and then dealing with family and friends, people are not psychologically able to deal with all of that. I just want to explain a little bit. Like what I'm doing now, I was raised for this type of a job. I was raised for it. Because when, uh, when I was 12, I started going to the Youth Authority, California Youth Authority, and... Uh, and I repeated that all the time that I was growing up. So if I would go when I was 12, I would get out when I was 14, and then I would go back when I'm 14, I would get out when I'm 16, and I would go back when I'm 17, almost 18, and when I get out, I would be 20 years old. So I was different from most, most people do big time when they're older. I did all of mine when I was young. But I was getting used to systems. And I had a behavior pattern that uh, when I studied, I, I see what it means. And I see what I was always challenging the system. And so... Or the authority, the consular, the ones leading, making us do this, that, and other. I would challenge them in front of all other kids. They had to isolate me. They had to, uh, no matter if they liked me or not, they said, well, you got to go. Because uh, it's, it, you, that's a disease. If, they, if that spreads, we won't have any more control. Because there's one, off, one consular or what? two consuls handling, like, let's say, 50 people. And if you don't respect them, 
one thing on the side. When a new guy would come on or something and he wasn't used to the program, we used to throw the guy for no control. That means all of us knew he was new, all of us. So we would act like we don't know what to do. It was called, we, we called it no control. Somebody said throw him for no control and it was spread. It, every, all the white boys, Mexicans, blacks, everybody, we're going to throw this joker for no control. We're going to educate him. And then they'd have to call the, the assistant head, uh, head group supervisor, assistant head group supervisor, which was like a lieutenant or a head counselor from another unit or another company, another cottage that have the experience. See, after he get, he's there for, for a long time, you can't do that no more because he already know what to do. But when he first get there, you throw him for no control. I said stop, and you keep walking just like, you know, because we used to march in companies, you know, like uh, military style. It was a sad notice since we marched military style, Sometimes when groups would pass each other, they'd head up, shoulders back, and then they would start real marching, you know. And then that was one thing we used to do. We'd stomp the left foot. Whop, whop. It makes a noise when the people are, you know, when you're young, you do stuff like that. Or you would dig in your heels, lifting your leg way up and coming down. They Shoe shop stopped us from doing that because uh, in half step, the institution, when you have step a long time, they took us on a forced march one time at this school, Rico Ranch School for Boys. We have stepped for three miles. That means we wore out all the shoes. The shoe shop told them, don't, don't have them do that no more because they're wearing out all the shoes. I can't, we don't have this many shoes. You know, for the people to be uh, half step mean you're almost dragging your feet. You're wearing out the heels and then digging your heels in. They told them stop that because the guys come in get new heels every. You do all that, it makes a nice sound all at once. Whop, everybody hitting their heels. Hit them heels. Whop. Anyway, long story short, you know, I was never in the military, but I was in those jails. I grew up in, so I'm system organized. I'm orientated towards systems. I know what systems do, what they feel like, what they look like. If you challenge the system, I know what the system do. It doesn't make any difference what it is. So what we're doing now, we already know. We knew from the day we got started and before what happened when you challenge the system. Number one, you have to be isolated. That's what segregation is. That's what isolation is. That's what the hole is. You see in the movies, the guy always, the tough guy always going to the hole. Okay, well, that was me. Not that I was tough. I wasn't tough or mean. I just, I didn't, uh, in fact, they really treated me a certain way because I disrespected authority, you know. And so since I disrespect, that's the worst thing you can do is disrespect the authority. I mean, if you run away, you're not disrespecting the authority. The white boys could run away, which is supposed to be the worst thing you can do. They got to call these people, let people get everybody looking for you, which they didn't do. They just go to your mama's house, you know, and wait for you. But to disrespect authority means that you have to be cut off, you have to be isolated because it's a disease. If that disease spreads, hey, the system's in trouble. Now, that's what we do right now. All of these are old. Racism, Zionism, apartheid, the triangle of terror, that's what we call it then. This is the same period. Uh, who's the real terrorist, the devil's triangle. Uh, of course, uh, so 
we always call it Zionism, Americanism, and apartheid. They were all, uh, that was a triangle of terror. It's, it still is a triangle of terror. Okay. So when I went to the youth authority, I would do two or three times the time that somebody else would because of this, the not respecting authority. I didn't have fights with, uh, well, when you're kids, you have some fights, but I didn't have that many fights with other uh, in fact, everybody usually kind of liked me a little bit, and I was a little petty leader, and uh, I was good at business, so we could have more candy than, you know, my crew, so that stuff. So it wasn't that. It was why you have to go to the hole all the time, why you have to be segregated because you're a disease, and diseases have to be isolated. Quarantine. They have to be cut off. They have to be isolated. They have to be segregated. That's what they call all those holes. Segregation, isolation, da -da 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 -da, all kind of modern names. But they mean you have to be cut off. It's the worst thing you can do is respect our authority. Now, out in here, what's the worst thing you can do? Not respect boss man's authority. Now, you got to think about it. We're Muslims, and we totally disrespect Zionism, which is worse than what boss man do. It's our level up. We disrespect Americanism, Zionism, and all other forms of oppression. And all our friends are the people who also disrespect them. And over the years, like we have, all of our friends have survived and most of them thrive. You look at Iran, it's thriving, right? You look at Hezbollah in Lebanon, during the, the, the big wars, every time they fought Hezbollah, Hezbollah back in... Uh, 2006, we called it Bashirun, good news. Everybody was saying, good news? What are you saying? They're bombing and killing and murdering the people of Lebanon. I said, just hold on a few days. <clears throat> That's going to be good news. <clears throat> and we said in July of... Uh, 2006, we made three separate lectures. We called it all of them by Shiru. By the time the last one come out, it was good news. And we did it. It was only three weeks, but in the first couple of weeks, how could you say that? That's good news. They're killing. They're bombing our sure facilities. They're bombing everything. And during that period, in Lebanon, they combine second generation weapons with third generations, and they was able to defeat fifth, fourth, and fifth generation Israeli weapons. Israeli, and, and they was doing, that's what I told them, that's good news. I said, no, 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 no. And they did it, and they did it with uh, a flare that caused, uh, you could see on American TV, the news you would see, you could see Zionist soldiers sitting on tanks crying. They had to get that off there because it caught them by surprise. Nobody does that to Zionists. But boy, did they... That was good news, and nobody saw that but us. 
And on top of that, it laid a big defeat. Now, you got to remember, years before, six years before, the Zionists removed themselves from Lebanon. No treaty, no nothing. 2000, just from getting hit all the time, they pulled out. That was a victory. Okay. And 2006 was a huge victory. That means that the uh, the brothers had prepared ahead of time. They had all kind of systems and mechanisms in place, and they employed them. And they whipped the Zionists so bad, they was crying real tears. And even today, they'll mumble like, we're going to do this to Lebanon, but you don't hear it. They do it to Palestine but not that much. And then the Palestinians, I mean, the the Hezbollahis did that to defend what was happening in Palestine. Yeah, okay. So, in other words, they brought all that down, the weight of Israeli Zionism down on themselves to help their brothers. So the Shia brothers attacked the Zionists to protect their Sunni brothers, something you don't see usually. No, you don't see it hardly at all. They just, because they're afraid and they're cowards, and they they acted up. And until recently, they had them going. Now, there's something that I want to mention, not only about Tuskegee and goal setting and what have you, but I want to mention strategic depth. Strategic depth means that your platform, your policies, your thinking have to be deep. So I call it strategic depth. That means that our thinking, and our history prove it. Our every, all, everything proves it. We've been boss man bites the dust, all of that. This is, maybe it's an old saying, but it's new to everybody now. Because everybody's looking, look what happened to boss man. I'll get back to strategic depth, but think about it. Boss man all over the world. They have a thing in Central and South America and uh, the the Jamaicans say, hey, uh, we don't know if we, we can go along with that. You know, the Jamaicans, what did they say? They say, instead of uh, cutting ourselves off from people, right? I was listening to the lady this morning. Uh, she was one of the... Uh, she said, instead of having a narrow cast, we want to broadcast. You know, this is a broadcast. I said, look, she still, I can tell she colored. Look at her. Right. She says, some people are telling us to have a narrow cast. In other words, only the people that you select can come to these regional meetings we're having with all of South America and what have you and the Caribbean. They want to have a narrow cast. They want to have their selected people come, but we push in a broadcast. In fact, they might not even win. They said, we want everybody to come. Because how can we deal with the uh, environmental circumstances dealing with our region if everybody's not there? So in Latin America, they call it, we want to have a a broadcast or a broad net. We want everybody to come instead of a narrow cast. <laughs> you know how the Negro, you could tell the lady was colored because, you know, that's the way we would come to the conclusion. Broadcast, everybody. Narrow cast, that's what they say. Anyway, look. The 
main policy that we have uh, structured and organized and we're using up to this minute is a surprise to boss man and is ahead of him. Because uh, one thing we realize, boss man got a system and all that, but any system, when its time has come, you don't have to do nothing but forecast and keep yourself straight. Nobody has to do anything to the U.S. You don't have to do anything to the U.S. They're going to use all their past systems because they're going to, the system at that time will vote in a president that's been in the Senate for 40 years or more. And all he can do is regurgitate what he's learned. And he can't think of nothing new because it just won't work at that age. Right? It'll work at our age because we are facing a challenge and we, we don't, we don't have to hold on to a non-working policy. I go so far as to say is every, everything we do works. Almost everything we do, don't pay no attention to the cars not running and nobody's here and all of that. Just pay attention to one thing. I'll get back to uh, this uh, strategic depth. Study our analysis and how accurate they are and how much time it takes for them to come to a conclusion. Okay, if you go back over 10 years ago, uh, like, uh, yeah. That was 2011, that's right. And we said we're going to go through five stages, da 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 And I think I let it out all here. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the end, it's going to be regional unity and all of that. Well, for what we was talking about, look at the region right now. Look at uh, Iran is working together with Iraq. It's not fighting Afghanistan, right? Yemen is their home. And then Lebanon, Iran is helping Lebanon. And all of that region, right, is starting to work together or have been working together. So they have a regional vision now. They're developing. That's what they're developing. Just what we talked about 10 or 11 years ago, a regional vision. The old days of one rising up, no, we're all coming up together. And the ones that think like that are the ones that produce the environment. That is the Iranians and the Lebanese. That's why they're the only ones that keep the uh, Zionists off balance. Okay. Then when you look at, uh, at right now, now we went through several phases of that, but you look at right now. Since boss man that bites the dust, that was two years ago. And since, uh, okay, they mess with the cars, so I can't drive anywhere, and I don't go anywhere. And so that means that we should be back in the dark ages, right? We should slow down. We should be misled. Not true. Our analysis have improved since then. Why? Remember, always keep score. What's the score? What is on the board? You know, that means you keep the score. You know what inning it is. You know what, what you got to do. Shoot, man, this is the eighth inning. We got to load up the bases and make six home runs or we dead. Because that's what the scoreboard says. And it also, this is the eighth inning. You got one more inning to play, right? 
So you got to do it this inning or the next inning or you're finished. With us, we're looking at the scoreboard. And we're looking at the time that we have. That's why we can make all of these uh, analysis and prognications on where we are and what we need to do. That's why today we can talk about uh, Tuskegee and goal setting. Why we talk about Tuskegee and goal setting. Tuskegee but not. Because none of the people if you looked over the no talking man, the lawyer, I swear we got to do that. The crump is his name. Y'all see him. Sharpton, Jesse by dead, I guess, but the Sharpton's still lying. He didn't turn pointed nose and, and crazy, his hair falling out, but he's still lying. But everybody didn't picked up on on. Okay, now, uh, how about our analysis of them and all of the stuff that's going on? Everybody we've always talked about, they already showing who they are and what they're about. You know, even the Muslims, we would show their picture, we wouldn't say, I said, here's a limousine riding lady. And they say, you know, we told you about care. We demonstrated in front of care. A few years ago, we did four, five, six programs down there. We still have them on tape. Yeah, we told them what was happening then. And we told them care don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and take that Black Lives Matter sign. You remember they took that boy down? They took it down. Take that sign down. Okay, why is that? Nobody hardly uses Tuskegee and goal setting, purification of goal setting, constant purification. As you're moving along, you're constantly cleaning up because you, you're trying to get somewhere <clears throat> and you're rubbing up against all the people and all the environment. And they're saying, man, you get farther and faster if you just mix a little of this here and here and there. You're going to get big money, you're going to get this, and you're going to get that, and you just keep right on rolling and don't pay no attention. That's Tuskegee and goal setting. That's purification and goal setting. And that's what we've done. We, we have actually technically, I think, we've improved a lot on goal setting. And... Uh, the not discomfort, but the uh, the uncertainties and all of that that's mixed in with it. It might have been big forty years ago. It might have been big thirty years ago. But in '86, when we wrote on our thing, that uh, it's a big victory that them stealing our stuff in 86, you know, stealing our uh, the stuff here. Notebooks and all that. Just, just a notebook. If they steal this, it wouldn't make no difference. I got all this stuff here in another place that I put in there. And if they get both of them, we got it all on CD, DVD. And we got some here, some there. And do we have to get them all? No, if we got t 10 CDs and DVDs over the whole period, we would have it all. Why? Repetition and keywords and all of that stuff. Uh, so we have actually, uh, like, like we said, we didn't caught boss man in the headlights of history. And he paralyzed. Look at him all over, everywhere he go. Look at U.S. policy right now. Look at U.S. policy. Okay, in this hemisphere, he's just having a meeting. He tell everybody, okay, we don't want them to come. We don't want Venezuela to come. We don't want Cuba to come. And everybody said, well, you keep your meeting. Even Mexico said, bump y'all, man. I don't know what I mean. 
Why should we be there if, if our homeboys can't come? Right? And the U.S. is looking stupid. Right? Right now, well, I haven't listened for the last few hours, but their whole policy that they have for Russia, right? Their whole policy. Oh, what is it? Let me see what the ruble did. They want. They wanted a. Yeah, okay, well, right now, the last I heard, it was uh, the Russian ruble. Uh, it started out at one ruble, was 85 something or other, a whole lot. You know, a lot of it wasn't worth nothing. And now, it's one ruble and 53. I don't know, whatever it is. So they had capital con capital control. They got control of that. They put their plan in place. And it's working. And even in the lying news, they, they can't lie less, but they have to explain First, they're killing Russian generals that doing this, that, and other, and it'll be, and this guy going around with a t-shirt on is so he's a tough guy. Everybody love him. And Europe, EU mean caves and hillsides and rope is a rope to bind in. But anyway, <laughs> that's what it's feel, looking like now. Europe. Okay, the other day, I guess it's still going. I don't know what happened today. When we was here Friday, they had a strike. I know as of yesterday, they were still striking. The rail strike, yeah. right? Now, and, today, though, but are they having a rail strike? For all kind of reasons. And they, they one thing can slow it down. Okay. Uh, they wanted everybody to be against Russia. And silently, everybody is on Russia's side. Because after colonialism, when they broke up all the countries, I mean, when they tried to make a country, well, when they make Sudan, that in the old days, Sudan had 10 borders, you know. Uh, they just drew a line down the map. So the people on one side... It's not the way uh, geography works, but that's the way they, European geography works. So all the people in Africa know about these artificial borders and what have you. And so they sympathize with border warfare because they have it every other day. You know, so if anything go wrong, if anything go wrong, like right now in Ethiopia and Eritrea, whatever, if one thing go wrong, they go, they just back right back up to the other old border and start fighting. You know, until everybody's tired, but they still do that. Okay. So this Tuskegee, not Tuskegee, but Nas. But Tuskegee and goal setting I mean we as a people, and if it's Africa, it's Africa, if it's the world, so we're trying to go somewhere. Okay, in order for us to get there, what type of plan are we going to have? What type of policies are we going to have? We have to, Tuskegee and goal settings mean that you, have, you try to purify your goals so that the, the things that you do to get to those goals are also cleansed. That don't mean it's going to be perfect. You're going to do a few things that's a little shady. But you're going to do 89% of them just in a line with the 
cleansing and becoming better. That's at a high enough level, level to where nothing's going to go big time wrong. The United States don't do that. They want to clean up, straighten up the border. Well, if they had a Marshall Plan for Europe, and they said, well, what we'll do is we'll send old money down there, over there, and we'll rebuild Europe. And they did. The Marshall Plan. Anybody ever heard of the Marshall? It's in history. Yeah. But in South America, they want people to stop going across the border, but they, they're going to have all the money is in America. It ain't going to be, you're not going to have any money down there. That don't make no sense. Therefore, you can't solve the border problem. Instead of fortifying that border, you send all that money that you use, just send the money that you're using to protect the border. Send it down there. And make sure the poor and the medium people get it. They can open little stock shops and stores, right? And you're sending enough money down there that they can spend money down there and do well and they don't have to come up here. It's too simple. It's too simple. It's like, you know, like you don't get that boss man. No, boss man bites the dust. Now, we said it a long time ago, but uh, Pulseman has no policy of, re of recuperation, of cleanliness, of purification, of anything. All he has is a policy of buffoonery and clownery. And that's why we clown him. We clown Pulseman. We say, you don't deserve. We're not mad at you. We don't get mad at all the mean stuff boss man do. No sense. Just clown him. And that's what we're doing. Every time we come up, we just clown boss man. And I want you to imagine how does he feel when everything we say up here over the years come true Next week, a week after, a month later. Simple. He tried to cut us off for travel. And you know what I started using? The doggone phone. So instead of going down to Martin Luther King Library, which I used to love to do, and I would go through there, and first I'd go down this row and I'd pull out a book. I'd pull out a book. And then I would go through them. And then I would come back with a stack of books. And I would read them. It was, it was helpful, very helpful. Uh, but to tell the truth, I don't have to, I don't imagine ever having to go to Martin Luther King Library again. A simple phone. If I want to research, if I didn't heard something about post-traumatic, whatever we call it, post-growth. All I do is type it in the thing. I can do that much. And I sit there and I get article after article after article. Not only old articles, but the ones that came out 2021 or early, you know, all the stuff. That's why our analysis is getting more accurate than years ago. These, these analyses now are pinpoint accurate and they're time specific. Some time ago, you would take years for it to develop. Now, it's so time specific, it only take, uh, it's almost right there. Why? Can you imagine? that from every university and every program that they have in the world, just about, on a certain subject. Now, take a subject that you know a lot about. But you can hear all of their experts. Just sit right there and listen. Do a little exercise, drink a little coffee, and listen. 
and take notes. And then, if they mention something, you could push another button and the doggone thing will pop up on your phone and you can go down and print it out. Not an old article from 10 years ago, but from February 2022, right? And if you want to hear about Asia, what happened at, y'all see how this stuff works. Y'all was actually trying to turn me on to it years ago because I would just refuse. I mean, my kids would say, Dad, you don't have to take those CDs. You could just get all that stuff on your phone. And I was trying, believe it or not, this is just a year or two ago, I was trying to imagine how could I get all of that stuff on the phone, even though they show me, they said, see, look, watch this. And if I want to see something on TV, I can get it on the phone and put it on the TV. I said, that's magic. That stuff don't work. You can't do that. And then they do it in front of me, and I still, you know, living in another century. And they would tell me, Dad. Now, I was doing good going down to Martin Luther King. This is years ago, getting old books. Because anything old, uh, uh, the latest book that Martin Luther King has got to be five years old. The latest. They got to print it. They got to get it out. You may get something 2020 if you're lucky. But you're not going to get a last week's study. The doggone telephone had this is, and it has how long this is. A lecture, you see how it show you? This lecture is uh, uh, three weeks old. And now when I want to learn something, I don't even listen to the ones from last month or so-and-so gave a lecture uh, three years ago. I don't want to listen to that old raggedy stuff. That stuff is old. It's good, but it's old. I'm telling you, uh, it's just ridiculous. So just updating yourself means that uh, I don't have to have a car running. If I want to go somewhere, I can drive one of them that still works a little, whether it squeaks or not, or I could just go. I don't need to go. I used to go by, man, you ought to see all the books I got in different places. I would buy all the old books, you know, because when I go to the library, there's a library used to be over on uh, in Maryland. Out by Georgia Avenue, and uh, they'd have a whole section on used books. You know, and I'd go out there, and I got tons of That's how I got books. I, 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 I would uh, take it easy and get control of yourself now. Count to 10 or something like that. No, no, that's okay. But anyway, I would buy all of those books use books, and I read them because I'm a strategic manager. I want to read all this type of stuff, and I would read all of that stuff, and I still have all of that old stuff around, but you know, I don't have to do that anymore. I can just type in strategic management 2022 or 2021, and all right, there it is the latest discussions on strategic management. Uh, the stuff I was reading before is 10 or 15 years old, and uh, you'd have to... Uh, it makes no difference. The point is that everything comes to you at a certain time. So if forecasting was our strong suit and information... And analysis was our strong suit, right? That we analyzed back in the 80s, we'd go to all the programs, we'd hear all the Islamic. That's why we could analyze, you know, we went to all those programs. 
And we listened to what was happening in Africa. What does that mean? What's happening in the Arab world? What does that mean? What's happening with Iran? And we had to analyze. Now, I just use credibility. I know if I get this from Iran, I know how the people think and write and talk, and I can analyze how accurate it is. If I look or hear something uh, as a nice lady come on, uh, the Indian lady, boy, but if it's, it's, it's India, I mean, it's fine. But if it's Pakistan and China, I said, boy, that's the line. This lady I have is good God. And mean, too. Uh, you know, like mean, like, yeah, you so-and-so, you know, over there. And uh, But I know what weight to give it. You see what I mean? Because I know who's, you know, where you you just get used to, just like we got used to who wrote the articles of us from the Zionists or something, da, 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 the Wall Street Journal. Now you can get Wall Street Journal, you can get every newspaper, you can get all of that right on the cell phone, telephone. And all you have to do is analyze. Now they just said this, okay. I think that's about 75% accurate what Kishore Mubobani said. I think he's accurate. And then I watch the old prime minister of Australia, which speaks perfect, excellent Chinese. I'll tell you his name in a minute. He, uh, yeah. He gave good talks on China last year. But in the, this year, he's anti-China because his people is anti-China. So I know how much, how many things to give him. You know, because he, he changed, he flips up. Okay, so everybody I know this, this is a nice, not nice, but this is a mean old Indian lady. But I like the way the voice sounds because it sounds like the Pakistani people, you know, they speak, when they learn how to speak English, they speak, so they all sound the same. But if it's on China or things that India is not rolling on, I already know what they're going to say. It ain't going to be right. I also know what our friends are going to say. Right? And I know how accurate they are. And I have a good understanding of uh, the news cycle. And I know if I sit right here and all of a sudden the Negro lady is not on the press TV anymore. She disappears, then she comes back as they say in Spanish de vez en cuando, every now and then. And I knew her from before and she didn't call me on the phone. Uh, So it's easy to put together. Your friend is out and you're out. And now you're trying to wiggle your alternative thing that you had all along to wiggle yourself back in. When everybody knows who's everybody's team, you know, you know. I, I want to say something about this too. That's why we should never. I never get uh, shaky or nervous or uh, uh, unsure of myself about what we're doing. I mean, it's good to to analyze what you do so you don't make mistakes and you know. But the line we own, it's it's the right line. And the only reason I say it is because we've been on it so long, and this thing uh, about. Tuskegee of goals, 
It's something we've always used. We're just talking about it today. We've always used that. Purification of goals. We want to go to a good place, the right place, but we want to get there clean, healthy, and wholesome, and we ain't not selling nothing. We're not selling our pride, our forecast, or nothing to get to where we go. And if you watch, Allah will rescue us from anything, the little feeble, the Quran uses the term feeble, it's a spider's web, it's just feeble. Now, spider's web catch flies all day long, right? Because they're lightweight. But they don't catch bears, foxes, and gorillas and stuff. That's what we are. All we do is just wipe it off. We just run through the hills. We just wipe the spider's web off. It's a big web of intrigue. It's something for them. You're going to catch them. But you're not going to catch us. I'm not bragging, but they ain't caught us on hardly nothing. Can you imagine? These are from 1989. It was like that before, but these, racism, Zionism, apartheid, triangle of terror. This is a triangle of terror, too. Same type, same period, 1989. This one is around that time. Why would the designist and everybody else and every trap being laid, why, why it ain't working? It's not working because we've got a lot of protection on us. That's not bragging. That's just saying the doer say that if you do this, you do that, you got, you know, pretty good shot at uh, a lot of protection. And be careful about the doer of the oppressed because there's no petition between Allah and the doer of the oppressed. We're the oppressed, but we don't feel like it. We're the oppressed. Everybody else, everybody else feel that we're so oppressed that they count us out every day they get up in the morning and say, well, that's it for them. Their masjid is falling down. There's the cars are not running. Everything is falling apart. And we're still here rolling. And it's not bragging, but hell, we got more than all of them put together. It's unbelievable. That's part of it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's a good question. The other Muslims. Well, and I, yeah. uh, specifically, the ones we come in contact with, to be more specific, the ones we come in contact with, African American Muslims, they feel, they feel that they're part of that. Okay, I, I, I would have to separate. This is just an off the cuff answer, but I would separate them into different groups. Some who understand what we're talking about, they would classify us as being part of the oppressed. There's others who are pretenders, like there's others, uh, like uh, uh, Shias used to come here all the time. In fact, I got boxes of Shia literature over there that I went and got, especially for them. And they disappeared. They know about oppression, but they do everything they can to avoid it. In other words, they own boss man's team. There's other people who are semi, they hear about all the stuff over here and they know something is shady and they're influenced by the environment. Number one, their children at the university, they have a reasonable job. Or even if they just drive a cab, they're just doing fine. They're doing ten times as good as they would be back home. Okay. 
So those people, uh, they don't want to hear about oppression. And if you tell them, if you tell the old folks over at PGMA and a few other places, I don't know, they like Islam for themselves and they like Islam for their rituals and, and all of that. They are healthy, semi-insane Muslims. They're going to be at their eat. They're going to do. But uh, they didn't come here for that. It just so happens that when they got here, they meet in a little house and they said, why don't we buy a masjid? And first, you know, like years ago, they were houses and apartments and stuff like that. And then you start hitting 30, 40 years, 30, well, about 40 years ago, they started picking up. And by the 1990, they was putting up structures. And at the same time, the Muslim, the African-American Muslim was going into a decline or stagnation. That was during the chief's reign. So the chief's community was uh, stagnant. If you went, if you went to any one of the Imam Muhammad's programs in 1990, say right, right. Say if you went over to was went one program over there, then we went to another one of the place in Baltimore. We went to all of those around. We saw the typical crew. The older people my age, and then the younger people that they forced to come, that they had to come because of it, right? Okay. And then, uh, as time went on, uh, the old, the pioneers are passing away and they're leaving. And any people that's left, they practice Islam. But it's a very modest. It's almost like the immigrant Islam, except the immigrants is now telling them what to do or telling them you know, where they used to wouldn't take, listen to them. Oh, no, 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 no. And remember a year or so ago when we went up to uh, Atlantic City? A crew had just came back from Saudi Arabia. The crew that was doing most of the talking. No, they, 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 they was a lot of, had a few from Syria, but they had some that was in Saudi Arabia. Cause they was, when you could hear them speak, speak, they were saying we was in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, I remember one of them was giving advice to the brothers when we were sitting there in the prayer. He was telling them, Al Ghazali, Imam Ghazali is mumtaz and all. And I was saying, yeah, I agree with him only. We've been down with Imam Ghazali for 40 years. At least from the day after we became a Muslim. And they're just over there studying and, uh, okay, back to the question. How we view the Muslims here in America, they come in s several groups. Uh, the standard Muslims that we see uh, now, uh, but you have to watch and have certain expectations. 
you can watch it in the news and you can see it at programs. For instance, the African Muslims who, who come here, the parents are not, they come here to work they, and da, 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 da. But the children of the Africans, the police don't know that they're children of Africans and they treat them like black people. And when the kids go to school, they're treated like black people. And some of them don't even have accents anymore. They sound like uh, Negroes. Okay. That's a big difference. Because some of the people you see getting shot now have African names. The police shoot the guy, bam, when he's on the ground. He has an African name, Brother Muga Booga or somebody, right? So the police is too stupid to realize this is an African, not an African American. If I kill him, there's a message going out to the thousands of others. All the kids get it. They all get it. The parents brought them here to work, so, and they, they had good reason because they would be poor in most parts of Africa, really. Okay, here's the point. Uh, the young Africans, they're technically African Americans, although they didn't have the slave experience. Who needs it? They got the police experience. They got, if they're in New York, they're stopping them, search them, because, uh, right? They're sending them through the, uh, the Negro experience. So they will have, they do have the same view as the police. Their parents, if something happened, their parents will call the police, but they won't. So there's a lot of things working for us, the dynamics. The MSAs in the late 70s and all that was semi-revolutionary on the campus or not that bad. The Indo-Pakistanis was orientated toward Milano Mauduri. Even if you read some of the old magazines in that time, you'll see they was semi-movement. They were Ikwani type. So that was sufficient. Then it came a time when they got real quiet all the immigrant community. But if you notice on the campuses now, the immigrants, what I'm talking about, the children of Arabs, the, ch the, ch the, the, the children of uh, Pakistanis, all of them, guess what they are? They are Americans. And the Constitution says, right? They've been to American schools. They're college educated now. They've been through the whole... And we're... Hey, you can't do that to us. The parents won't say nothing, but the children, and you go to these college campuses, to try to bat that down, they got Yusuf Estes and all these other people trying to blankalize them. You know what I mean? Yeah, blanco lies them, right? <clears throat> That's going to wear out too. I don't think you might remember, but I, I remember. <clears throat> Siraj gave a talk <clears throat> over a decade ago out there. What's the university over there? Is it GW? Yes. Do you remember that? He gave a talk at GW. All of us, for Khan and everybody went over there. Siraj was speaking. And uh, Sarai said, oh, my Imam, Imam Musa. And so he went on to say, Imam Musa said something to me. I was talking about drugs. 
and he he was in that uh, working with the police, doing everything. And I told him what out in California he was out there. <clears throat> anyway, they had invited me to speak out in Virginia. Yusuf Estes was at that program. And when he realized who I was, see, I've been talking to him on the phone. When I realized, when he realized who I was, the body name and the face, whoosh, he ain't talked to me since. And if he sees me at any program, he's mad. Because he know we know who he is. He's part of the new blankalized, uh, blancolized attack on Islam. <clears throat> and that as long as he's messing with immigrant Muslims, they're going to be happy. They're going to be happy, and he's going to talk to them about Christianity and how to bring it. And if you look at if you look at the the Euros that are white, they're not bringing no whole lot of white people to Islam. They ain't. They don't go to white people. They go to. They take a. They come from the. They come from now. They become the chief of staff at any masjid. Now if we're going there. I, I saw this sister. I was telling you all about her on the. Boy, look at here. Uh, this white woman down in Texas was walking. It's time for prayer, so she was walking next to him. You know, she put her hands on the Negro lady, and that she almost she almost jabbed her. She was already mad. Number one, why don't you just stand in line? And we all we know how to straighten this line up. Everybody here has been a Muslim 100 years. You don't need to walk behind us and on the, and this. But she's white. And that's the way the Negro lady felt. This B blankety blank is going to, first of all, they, Sapphire is already treated like a second class citizen because she took Shahada. It's okay. But when, uh, Jane took Shahada, boy. They had a celebration, fireworks, and everything. And not that they get mad. I don't not say I'm not. But we're going through uh, that phase that phase right now. We have to be patient with the educational phase that Negroes and Muslims and humanity go through. They're not going to be in our stage because they're not going to come in contact with the things we come in contact. Suppose uh, any masjid, D.C. area, came in contact. Suppose the imam, if he went out to his car and it wouldn't start. Then he got another car and he drove it for a week and it wouldn't start. Or if he bought some new tires and they went flat. Or if the starter wouldn't work and it sounded nice the day before. Or if people were hinting to him to stay away from certain people or certain lectures and talks and you'll be all right. And he tries it and everything smooths out. So either... He's going to get mad and do more things revolutionary. Or he's going to cooperate with a vengeance that he knows what this means now. Uh, no one no trouble, but I know what it means. So that means when he sees certain other people getting certain things, he know why they got it. He'll learn from experience even though it's light experience, this experience that he goes through is sufficient enough to get him to, i put it this way, the stage we talked about in the early years, uh, Pakistanis beware, this kind of police, that kind of police, and here's how you say this, that, and other. 
And after they put a couple of them in jail, right, then they knew. And if they saw 20, 25 years ago, they put a whole crew of people in jail for paintball, which I've been in the woods and I saw the police practice with paintball right, right, right over there. The point I'm making is, is this evolutionary process, the various communities, uh, just try to measure a little bit about the uh, the attitude about us when we go out. So we change the formula. We go out and prepare food. Oh, why you prepare? Why you give it? This is this is a ten to fifteen dollar meal. Here, easy. You mean I can have two pieces of chicken? It's a big piece of chicken. That's a, a quarter of a chicken almost. You know, the same thing costs, the, the meat costs 10 or $15 and then with all that. Uh, why are you doing it? We're just trying to say thank you to you guys. We have a flyer that says the same thing in a few days. We're just trying to say thank you. You guys always help us out and uh, you're helping out have got us to where we are. Da, 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 da. It's not exactly true, it's, but it's reasonable. It's kind of true that a lot of what they did helped us get to where we are now. Therefore, you can see that the policy that we have is upgraded and it's changing and adapting but you can see how much opposition, it seems simple, <clears throat> but right over there in Baltimore, right? Right over there in Baltimore, they send a nice Pakistani guy out to uh, said, we'll help. And he was serious. Not only will help, I got to help. And then, not only will he help, but you guys take a rest. Why? It's very simple. That plate is so good and well prepared that they're not used to seeing Negroes giving away stuff. Fisabilila. But if he's in charge, he owns a restaurant and he just wanted to to thank us for all of our da, 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 da. and that's why he was there he he came back three or four times remember that to get rid of us because everybody's lining up and we didn't mean to interfere with the trucks business but everybody's lining up, and they are happy. Well, the next one they have over there, we'll have three times as much of stuff. As, or we'll have two days, and then maybe we might do the whole three days. But we know how to do it now. And remember, when we went over there, you remember somebody stole our meat? And a, and a pan of eggs. Now, what did we need over there? We needed meat and a pan of eggs. And they stole it from down there, and then they put it back, I think. I think they put it back. And it couldn't have been in there because I dug down and looked, and then uh, the meat, I had it, uh, so I couldn't. Okay, and then they... A couple of days later, it pops up. The point I'm making is, Tuskegee of goals. That's what we're doing, right? You can see what we're doing. It's purification of goals. Uh, could you turn the air on just a bit? 
that we're purifying our goals as we go along. You know, that we don't want you just to help us, but actually, uh, this is why we're doing this, and the people are shocked, right? And it lowers, it lowers a lot of uh, the lies people tell about us. You see what I mean? Now, just imagine over at Darl Hidger, we're going to try to get permission to go out there and, you know, just the parking lot, not on Friday necessarily, but we could do it. They have so many people, we could do it. Uh, we just figured whether we do it at Asa or my group because if this, if we do it at this late during this time of the year, by the time they get home, it's nine o'clock from my group. And if we serve the food at eight thirty, it'll be get this period. It'll be eight thirty when they come out and after a while it'll be 8.45 in fact it might be 8.45 when they come out now this is June yeah the longest day of the year is June 21st that's right so this is the longest period so it would be 9 o'clock when they come out so our question is whether we want to go over at around 4 and set up so when they come out at five, they could take a plate or they could take a plate home or whatever they want for their family or, right? That's our only discussion. Again, we want to let the people know we're not here just to, uh, to get from you. We want to give to you. And it seemed like the universe is lining up and this. Whatever, it'll be all right, you know. Now, according to the original questions about the people and their sincerity and how this group and that group, if we will go back, <clears throat> well, I'll go to leadership first. Imam Warthadine Muhammad was a good man. He was a he was technically, he was internally, he was, he was a good man. But politically, he was not. Uh... But after I saw what he was dealing with and understood it, I might not have left the community years ago. Because when he came in and then he gave a lecture in 77th, I think sometime in July, and he said, I'm going down to the FBI and I'm going. So he met with somebody from the governor's offices in Illinois and the FBI. And then he followed up a lot of the stuff uh, with prisons and what have you. With, uh, he gave some decisions on uh, Ramadan. He gave certain positions on uh, uh, what his ideas was about things that we were fighting for. And they had changed from the early 70s to the end of the 70s and going into the 80s. So our view changed. But when I look at the decisions he made, his decisions were not bad at all. Do you remember him giving a, a lecture, a couple of lectures, and he would turn around and he said, these people, they're not with me. Do you remember any of those? I haven't seen them, but I definitely You've heard, yeah. Yeah, no. Well, what's the name? The fat black man is, was at one of them. He was, he was at a, you know, yeah, he, he was at one. He, he, he had verified. Uh, so, uh, 
the things he said, the things he did, and the, the things realizing that the nation of Islam was 100% infiltrated by the United States government. From up there to down there. And say the higher that you went, the higher level of infiltration. And down at the lower levels, what the Negroes was being taught was just so bad and so coloredish that uh, it was a gang. But the stuff that uh, Imam Muhammad went through and he began to evolve and he began to Islamicize and he got more comfortable with his position. Uh, the only thing is with his crew, we had said so many things in the earlier years that uh, when you mention Imam Musa, it's just uh, they pull down the shade, you know. You know when they when you mention Imam Musa, they pull down the shade. Are you taking pictures or? Uh, oh, you just okay. So anyway. They uh, they automatically, the community went through certain changes and transformations that at certain times you would realize that from where he was, he made good decisions based on what was coming his way. Because number one, if it was the NOI and later on it was him and all his people, he was surrounded like me and anybody else, Dr. Kaleem Siddiqui, like any other Muslim leader. Uh, 99, 99, not that bad, but uh, most of the people. And see, when the people get in a position, they start, they start managing the evolution. The people at the top are managing the evolution at the people in the middle and at the bottom. And they're not elevating anybody unless they're on their team. That's why if you look at Imam Muhammad, he changed to his own personal account about funds. So send it to... Imam Muhammad Dawa, da 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 da. Because the level of corruption, when I would go to the to the temple in '65, the minister was Bernard Kushmir. I don't know if any of y'all ever read. This is the one, and our Savior has arrived. Those are old books. But that was Bernard Kushmer. Bernard Kushmer was the imam, was the minister in San Francisco. Bernard Kushmer was moved to Phoenix because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was moved from Chicago to Phoenix because of bronchitis, the weather. See, it's hot and humid there. You ain't going to... Yeah, so he loved it. So that became... He, he was in... He, he couldn't be in Chicago most of the time, maybe a few months out of the year if the weather permit. But he mostly was... In the last years, he was in, in uh, Phoenix... So when I would go to the the temple after Bernard Kushmir, then Henry Majid came. I know y'all don't know these names, but Henry Majid. And he used to talk about all the stuff I talk about. Now if the FBI come and say this to that to you. But the FBI didn't ever come in those days to say nothing to me. The FBI used my friends. Now, 
this is a key point. My friends in the early day, I'm talking about 65, 66 and all that, it was only a few people smoking a lot of weed. So when I used to do fishing, I'd take teams of people over to the temple, or at least one of my friends would ride with me all the time. Uh, and I would ask them, uh, man, how much do this weed cost? Because I was thinking of it like prohibition. During times of prohibition, that's when gangsterism grew and flourished in America. And then I thought about it. I said, this is prohibition. It's the same thing as prohibition. So now I didn't know I was high, but if you sit in the car and on the Bay Bridge with the windows rolled up or the air angle, you got to contact high. Plus you running in the hills every day, lifting out, you, your body's clean. So anyway, uh, after I started getting high, I knew that I was getting high already from that contact. But the point is, is Bernard Kushmir, Henry Majid, Bernard Kushmir moved to, moved to Arizona with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Henry Majid came in later and he would talk about, uh, now there was only one guy that we could talk about with stuff like this that was here. That's why when we went to Sudan, uh, Askia Muhammad, Askia Muhammad used to be the editor of what they call Muhammad Speaks. He was the editor. So he knew everybody and we could, all these people we talking about y'all ain't never heard of, we knew all of them. And so, in fact, he's the one told Hadari because Hadari was, something came up and uh, uh, what's the name told her? <laughs> this guy here got the 911 on the whole show. You know, he was telling him, this guy here, i tell you what happened when he found out. Do you remember we did a program downtown that uh, came on C-SPAN? Yes. And we was talking about certain people. The way he and I got close was, he said, you know, the first assignment I had when I went to California was W.L. Nolan. And that's what I was mentioning in the lecture by W.L. Nolan. He was shot on the, on the yard in Soledad. Da, 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 da. In other words, and then when we began to talk about all the people, it was just like, uh, almost like Siamese twins, except he's still stuck on certain things, you know. And I let him see certain things because we went to a program in New York and all it, one of the, when President of Iran was there. So after a certain time, the first train comes back here is at 5 o'clock. So you have several hours kind of waiting around. So it was some brothers there from out of town. They had a room. Whenever they have it, these big hotels, a lot of brothers. So we went up in the room with the brothers and we rested in the room. And he saw the discussion between us and the Iranians and how it was linked in. But when he wanted me to mention something about, you know, his man. And uh, that happened to be one of the negative meetings, because in that meeting at the tables, all that, 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 they had me way at the back, they had the camera back there, they had uh, 
New Yorkie, ma'am, and then they had the National Negro. And the National Negro, uh, and they was even saying, yeah, we got to talk to them about the money. That's what they're saying at prayer time. So the National Negro is piped in to tell me that you're persona non grata and they and they trying to work with us now. And they're saying it over there. And the people that passed away was headed all these things. Uh, well, we've been talking to, I tried to explain the concept of what Faki to the minister. So I just told her, I said, the minister don't only want he don't even want to hear what you got to say about no Walaiti Faki unless it's running through him. So uh, he don't want to hear none of that. You know. So that's where he was, uh, you know, at that time from the very top, They was, uh, hey, man, a lot of stuff come up. I have to tell you one time. We're in the elevator one time. This is in Iran. Uh, have anybody ever heard of the name Ahmed Jibril? Front for the Liberation of Palestine? He's one of the big boys from the old days. We were on the elevator. Muhammad Alasi is on the elevator. So, Ahmed Jibril asked me about the National Negro. I said, the National Negro is the police and da 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 da, and this, that, and other. And Muhammad Alasi says, uh, he's kind of like uh, Abdul Nasser, you know. The, it was the president of Egypt, Jamal Abdul Nasser. Abdul Nasser was a, a nationalist, and he was anti-Islamic against the Muslim Brotherhood, put him in jail. Okay, anyway, here's what they say. Everywhere I was, and all the people that I was associated with, from my understanding of them, they was almost all the police. Back to Imam Muhammad. Imam Muhammad did a good job based on what he knew and what he had. Uh, his brother... Nathaniel Muhammad got arrested, got a case, and uh, he was a minister. Nathaniel Muhammad was a, the minister in Kansas City. Now, the fruit in Kansas City, the captain, the secretary, and all of them was in the brotherhood. That's why I met the whole East Coast crew. Black Mafia from Philadelphia, all of them was in, uh, we became very good friends. In fact, the tougher guys became better friends of mine, you know, all, all the real. So anyway, not to stray off the subject, we'll get back sooner or later. Well, we was at Leavenworth. Imam Warathuddin Muhammad came there. He came to investigate about his brother. His brother was telling them, telling everybody that because he's a son of Elijah Muhammad, that that's why he got arrested and is part of the COINTEL program. While on the yard, Leavenworth is 35 miles from Kansas City. There's a whole crew of federal prisoners from Kansas City. In fact, the fruit was there. The secretary, 
the uh, captain, and one more person. The whole staff of uh, the Kansas City Masjid was in Leavenworth, and we heard the radio all the time from Kansas City. That's what we listened to. And therefore, we stayed up on the news. Here's what I'm trying to say. Imam Muhammad came now to investigate Knox. Let me back up. We would hear on the yard, yeah, this is going on at uh, my shit. In other words, you could find out who just bought shirt because everybody's from, not a lot of people, they're from Kansas City and they talking about uh, the who, who is who and what's what and where they got sir. So the man was selling dope. Imam Muhammad came there to uh, investigate, and he never mentioned it again. He found his brother was guilty. He was dealing dope. Not only they had that big, beautiful masjid and didn't have no people in it, but anyway. So we have the internal workings of literally everybody. Now let me try to reframe it and put it together in a package that makes sense today. The immigrants' children are not children anymore. The, the kids going to school, university now, born in America, and they've maintained their Islam. The Pakistanis, the uh, Arabs, and all of them, including <clears throat> the Africans, like you will see at PGNA, and a few, they consider themselves Americans. Half of them were born here. Most of them were born here. They're college educated. <clears throat> they are not like their parents. Their parents believed it was a favor for the government to allow them to come here. But they see themselves as American citizens. You're not doing us a favor. You owe us, according to the Constitution, we have a right to this, that, 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 and their parents don't believe it. To their parents, that's not important. If you don't hit their parents specifically, they go around. But their children in the universities right now today, and the numbers are getting bigger, of people who are fully adults, college graduates. We've been had graduates from immigrants, children way back. This is getting old. So these are almost children and grandchildren of immigrants who are Muslim. And they feel we're fully Americanized. They don't say it, but they, they feel like what the Constitution guarantees, we got that coming. The parents, the grandparents didn't believe that. They, would, they didn't care. They had no concern about what happened to people inside of America, except when they got here, they found that African Americans were Muslims, and they were shocked. Shocked out of they shocked to death. Do you know al Fatiha? Sure, I, I used to play with them. You know, do you know this? You know, sure. You know. And then you recite it, Oh my God, they were so happy. Because remember how lonely they would be here? They're Muslims and nobody love them and everybody, all they hear on the news is hatred for Islam. And then here come Negroes. Yeah, I'm a Muslim. Yeah, da, 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 da. So they were overwhelmed. Now, in those days, our children were more revolutionary. And now, I would say our children and the immigrants' children are just about 
semi the same. They're close to the same. The immigrants, if they came through Imam Muhammad's community, they might be more modest than the immigrants. The immigrants' children might be more, a little more revolutionary. Yeah, because remember, the the, uh, the chief taught uh, inclusion, pacificism. Yeah, he taught that big. He taught big, and they and they they did it. The pioneers got that. And that's why right now the pioneers, like, uh, uh, hey, you know, there's two or three left, and and uh, they they just. Uh, they don't come around. If if it was ever you even said something about uh, Imam Muhammad, they, they, there's no repentance. You can't repent. You has nowhere to go. You're just bad forever. You're cursed. You're damned and you're condemned. Okay. Now, that's that crew. Now, the crew we're dealing with today... <clears throat> You got to remember that we are the target. Everybody else is on the payroll and they're on their particular payroll. If they're the National Negro, they get the National Negro payroll salary and he does the job of National Negro. If uh, the, the ministers, the imams, many of the imams, most of the imams, the older ones now came from way back and the new modern imams have been Americanified. I mean, it's like unbelievable. Right? So, the Islam that we're coming across now there's mixtures of differences. When something happened in the Muslim world, people would talk about it. Have you been to any Qutbah and you've heard anything about Yemen? No. Sometimes you hear something about Palestine, but is it sufficient or close to sufficient about Palestine? Not consistent. Not consistent. Not it's in, but you, uh, you when you go out of cookbook, somebody got late. What was the cookbook about, bro? They would never say it was about Palestine because they ain't gonna say it enough in there. Okay, we got a lot of things. I'm gonna try to put this all together that makes sense. We got a lot of forces working. Uh, right now. Most of those forces are working for us really big time. Number one, everything is coming out on the surface about who America is, what they do to people, and what they've been doing to people. Especially the Muslims. Okay. America has had several wars lately and haven't won any of them. And got put out of Iraq <clears throat> and run out of Afghanistan. And ruined Libya, just blew it to smithereens. And haven't put nothing in its place that's functional. And haven't said, we're sorry, we're sorry, we just messed that whole country and its whole system up. We sure didn't mean to do that. They don't say like that. Martin Luther King said it, longevity has its place. We have lasted so long that everything that we have said have turned out and we got it all on tape, CD, uh, 
cassette tapes, all of that have came true. Everything, everything. The, the lady, the boss man bites the dust. All of that. And the reason that is is because Tuskegee of goals. We already went through the process. Instead of talking about what we should do in the future, we talk about what we We've already practiced Tuskegee of goals because we've been practicing Tuskegee of nafs, purification of nafs. That's why they couldn't snare us with nothing. They couldn't snare us with women. Shoot, a guy do 14, 15 years of celibacy and running the hills, lifting iron and at the top of hell. Uh, you get the idea. Or they might think because of that, that guy's an easy target for fitna. But it turns out it was exactly the opposite. Ain't going to work, can't work, it's not important. It don't even enter the... And everybody they try with it, they try anything that they might think that might be appealing to the Negro. White girls, well, first they started with half white, half, you know what I mean, a mixture of Arab, Pakistani or Indian. And they started with the 50-50 crew first because everything they was thinking was this is what would be happening. It didn't work. People look nice, you know, but and, you know, it don't have nothing to do with nothing. And they weren't used to that. They weren't used to that at all. And in Oakland, they were shocked because they didn't believe it. Because all of their people, that was their hang-up. It was all about girls, flamboyance. The guy would say if the guy was president on the campus, you know, student body and all that. And we called them the curly-headed crew or the wavy-headed crew. Uh, all of those people that looked like that turned out to be crazy and uh, almost crazy. And the, the girls was the same way. The more beautiful a girl looked like according to the standards, I mean, the lighter and don't let her have green eyes and uh, that stuff, you know. And the blue veins, they had it worse. Uh, you know, the girls, you can see their veins because they're so light. Blue vein. Okay. When none of that works, or you do some things to test them. See, everything I'm telling you, I've already tested them on. I've already tested them two, three, four times. I tested in South Africa. I tested da, 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 da. And so I'm speaking with a little authority. And the Negroes thought that. Like, Hashem them thought a certain way. You see Berkeley crew. Uh, all the other people associated, they thought a certain way. And they thought when I would go to South Africa and how da 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 da, that's what Bahia and them thought, you know, and they would, because um, they come from the same crew. They all come from the same crew. I've tested and tried it hundreds of times, and it comes out like that. They've just been a flop. They've been a super flop. They have never made this big a flop system-wide in history that everything they did was a flop. On the racial issue, on the, the ethics issue, Negroes don't have ethics, especially sexual 
ethics that don't exist. That's what they thought. Till we come along, they think that now because we proved them wrong on everything. With everybody watching, with everybody get to got their ear to the thing. I'm trying to tell you, is everything that they used on the people, they failed with us. They failed with marriage and your family being the police. Some of our biggest leaders, they got married, they married them with a police, maybe the police from Canada, anywhere. Uh, I ain't going to mention no names, but I have a friend that I used to take him money for a certain causes. A while back, he told, stop giving it to the so-called wife. And give it to such and such. He knew. I said, good, he knows. He knows. Okay. To have everything in the, in the sink thrown at you and don't none of it stick, that's rare. First of all, it has never happened. And to pre-plan and pre-organize a semi-safeguard. How you semi-safeguard? First you come out and talk a little bit about this, a little bit about that. And pretty soon you start hitting it heavy. So before boss man can do anything about it, you've told the whole story. <laughs> you didn't tell it on the first time. You just eased up on a little bit, pulled back, eased up. And then ain't nothing he can do to you. So everything is an asset. Let me give you an example that come close. With my sons back in the 80s, they would live with me in the masjid and they would, so we would just talk, yeah, dad, you see this? And they would be right. So them, that's a support group. As far as they're concerned, I don't need no more than that. So the police got rid of them and every time they would come home from jail, they would send them back. If they wasn't in jail, they would send a little girl by the spot to hang out with them, to run with them, to send them back to jail and they kept them in jail. That's why I gave the kutbah uh, some years ago. I said, the police saved my son's life because they kept sending him to jail. I said, uh, and all of them have shown me photo albums of dead people. Everybody in their photo album was dead. Just like if a guy was in his 50, say 55, from 60 back to 50, You remember every now and then you used to see them guys in them a little automatic wheelchairs going around. You don't see them too much. They died out because they, but that was a time when they sent my sons to prison at the most dangerous period for a, a black man to be out running around. That's all you used to see around here. Rest in peace, so and so. It was the same way in Oakland. So I gave a cookbook. I said, the police saved my son's life by putting him in jail. And that's what I'd ask Allah, oh Allah, protect these dummies. Now I didn't say that. I said to my son. Sir. And that's what Allah did. Okay, the same with the other side of the family. The other side of the family might be, uh, you know, men are different with women and they would be get very protective right but if your wife is not the chief tattletale they couldn't stand nothing happened to their daughters they would go crazy they would flip out so boss man is stuck he can't do nothing to them the prison protected the sons and the system protects the daughters. They better not get hit by a train or a bus accidentally because mommy is going to think that it was a system. Yeah, so 
I'm telling you, when a law cover your behind, you cover it. That's more than anybody could ask for. It's too much to have protection against everything that is considered, first of all, family protection. All right. The next thing is international protection. Do you know how many tapes we didn't put out on all these people and all this stuff? If they had a recollection trying to get them all back together, it would be hard. Although this thing don't go as much as the next future generation, this will be going out big time. Right now, it goes out to a few. It's okay. It's no big deal. No problem. It doesn't make no difference. Here's what happened. We have confidence. <laughs> Amen. Sika. That Allah know what we need. And as long as we stick to this taskia bil nafs, taskia of goals, and we stick to it, no matter what, and if we don't get frustrated and sideswiped and, and start buying into this artificial the goofiest stuff you ever seen. We're going to be all right. And if there's people like Hashem them that have invited uh, Malcolm Shabazz and them and all, you know, nice guys that don't know nothing. And they collaborate to send them down to Mexico to get beat to death with a baseball bat. Them guys is vicious. And our greatest, some of our greatest basketball players that are free-handed with money helped everybody. Those people may be surrounded and managed right now. Not in a bad way, but in a way where they, they, they might be on a circuit. And they could go. I couldn't go on the circuit because I ain't going to. But if they're going to keep their subject with basketball and how to become a bit, da 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 da, da they'd be all right. And I sign off on that because that's sufficient. And first of all, be to be trapped by a bunch of bums like Hashem Alauddin and all of them from California that encourage a man to say certain things publicly because they lean a certain way and then back up on them and steal all their money, them and all their friends. See, those Negroes, I've had my eye on them all along. They stole all of his demands Stole it all, every dime of it. And with Malcolm, Shabazz, that poor guy has nothing to do with Islam. Every Islamic program I would be, he would be with there with a young tender. One of the girl, one of the brothers that we'd stay in the same house when I would do a program, Iranian guy. This was a few years ago, and uh he would have Malcolm come for a while. Do he says, "Man, he don't practice no Islam." And then he shows up at a big Muslim program with women that's not his wife, and he don't know nothing about Islam. He just has Malcolm Shabazz, and not only that, the Negroes sent him down to Mexico to get beat to death with a baseball bat. Them niggas are ruthless. And if I would have made a one slip, they would have did it to me. And I'm not bragging. The only reason none of it never happened. Well, everything did happen. I mean, they beat you, try to beat you. They do all that. But what I mean is it never sunk in and it never worked. Because they are a bunch of dummies. They're a bunch of government employees, and a government employees is not, uh, not that smart, just like somebody being in the Army. 
Only thing you learn is the government employees are, are routine. So if you're out in the world, you get in 30 years, you'll get 30 years of experience. If you work for the government, you get one year experience 30 times over. I said, so my idea about all of this and the main points, we'll go back to it and let us clarify one or two things. At number one, the United States is finished. It don't make no difference. It, it have got, this stuff has become habitual and has nothing it can do. Everything, if anybody notices the news, everything that happens, it just wiggles and goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And everything they do is going to, they're going to do everything that guarantee they lose. So if they invite a woman to be the vice president, the so-called black woman or Indian, it ain't going to do no good because they're going to engineer her into a place that, uh, I don't want to change the subject about a dictator or a dictator. That girl, when she was in California, she wanted to put all the people that if their kids didn't go to high school, they, she was going to put them all in prison. And she's supposed to be a nice black woman for vice president. Hey, they got them set up to lose. Number one, why anybody would get an old handkerchief-headed man that can't remember his name? to be present, to have the most stressful job. It turned Barack Obama's hair gray in three months. Remember that? Three months, just like that. He was still shooting hoops, but he, his hair turned gray because the white folks worry you to death. You know what I mean? They worry you to death. Okay. So with all of that stuff in mind, what it is when it's time for you to go down, you engineer your own or you participate in your own decline. So you would say, who developed the programs of decline for America? Well, it's the environment and it's also they participate. They make certain, certain things happen that guarantee their decline because it's time for them to go. So for us to forecast boss man bites the dust, it's not brilliant at all. It's just normal. It's because it's already in the pipeline. Ain't nothing to do. Okay, now with us, and I'll, I haven't strayed off the subject. It just seems like it. Uh, Dear believers, uh, this community has a great mission during the time we're living in. And so far, the Tuskegee Bill Nafs test and the Tuskegee of Goals, it does not appear that anybody have passed those tests. If it's the Negro imams, they've sold themselves for penny change. And now they're depressed. Somebody had an article about how depressed they were. They're depressed. For those people in that that they sent overseas, they was crazy to go, especially to Saudi Arabia, and they came back even crazier. We was to witness the whole crew there in Atlantic City. Yeah. On the global scene, the United States government has tripped and stumbled over everything it could find. It's like a blind man in a room full of uh, traps. 
it steps on everyone, it pulls everyone, so all of them blow up. Whether it's reaching out to people, whether it's the conference on Central and South America, right, and the Caribbean, a fluke, it, it flops. It flops bad. Whether it's Ukraine, Ukraine and supporting that, it's the biggest flop in the world. It's just an unbelievable flop. Number one, this is our friend. Number two, we told y'all to stop doing that because we, we don't want nobody like that on our border, you know. And you already got Poland and everybody with you, but you want to come next door. We can't have that. But it's just a no-no. Why would it be so bad? They had a missile crisis in Cuba. Maybe y'all wasn't born then, but uh, I was. I remember the missile crisis in 62. I think it was about 62. God, it was going to blow up at the whole Cuba if it didn't get the missiles out. So what do you think Russia's going to do if you're going to send a, a missile base right next to Ukraine? I mean, in Ukraine, next door to Russia, right? Okay. If your economy, you're talking about tanking. This boy done tanked. It's all over. There's nothing that anybody can do about it. Just remember the inflation that you've seen around. Uh, last year, year and a half, what does inflation look like? What does increase in salaries look like? Anybody seen any increase in salaries? No. I was just watching at one thing. I said, good God Almighty. I mean, you can see it in other things now. Stuff went from 99 cent to $1.99. I said, that's double up that. <laughs> that is bad. Other stuff have halfened up. 25% inflation. It's unbelievable. Okay. So now, about us. We have a good history. We've already explained where we're coming from. And we've earned the right to play a significant role in this next stage of evolution. And we feel like that uh, it'll be an honor to be a part of that next uh, transition. Uh, let me close out. The time is... Uh, so just remember... Zionism is racism. Simple. The triangle of terror. This one was about the same year. This one has a year on it. This is 89. This one was either this was either 89 or 90. It could have been 88. I don't think so. No, it's too early for 88. Yeah, because we're, I think it's the same time or one year later. It could be 90. Now, those here, remember, during the years right here, in February I, I'm, of 1990, I did an article, I did a talk on sewage. I said, beware of... Uh, like what I said was when you work in a sewer, when you come home, you don't smell yourself, but everybody else do because you've been working in a sewer. I was saying that because six months earlier, Imam Khomeini had passed away and things were beginning to, uh, I'm trying to show you how quick we pick up on things and it's on the record. It's the same thing right now. Uh, 
you don't have to guess as things headed the way we've talked about. You could study the, your, your notebook or your history and just listen to it. That's the way it's been going. That's not from arrogance. That's the way it's been going. That means we've made the right assessment from the very beginning, and we stand on that line. We're not going to mix up anything we're doing. And that's the road we're on. Let me see if there's anything else. So, Tuskegee and goal setting. Uh, well, it says your, your oppression has kept us energized. The oppression of the state has kept us energized. They keep messing with us, so they keep us souped up. <laughs> Doing good and an accelerated environment. Stuff is picking up, so we have to continue to do good. That's why we're going out and feeding and doing all that. So we're doing visible good in an accelerated decline. This is an accelerated. You notice how long things used to take? You notice... Pop, you turn on the news a day and something already happened. Bop, bop, bop. That's the way it is. That's an accelerated decline. Today, it's like World War I, this type of environment. If you've ever heard of the Triple Entente or the Triple Alliance, uh, the one is, uh, uh, let's say, Italy was aligned with the uh, the Ottomans was aligned with uh, Germany and what have you. And uh, the rest of the people was uh, aligned with uh, Britain, France, and America. And those allies brought the whole world into a war, World War I, because of those dumb alliances. They went to war. World War II... 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. Poland had a defense treaty with uh, France and England. So World War II started just like that. We're fortunate. <clears throat> we don't have no alliances with other Negroes or Negro movements. If something happened to them, we could get involved or we don't have to get involved because we don't have any alliance with any of them. Some of them say la ilaha illallah or all of, all of them say it except a few. We don't have much to worry about because none of them are on our side visibly. They don't come by, they don't do that. We could be right 10,000 times in a row. We could answer every question on the quiz. It doesn't make any difference. Somebody has instructed them to stay home and leave us alone, right? It's clear. All the brothers that used to be here, they left for no reason that we could find. And guess what? That's good. You look at us and see if you ever see us lonely. Oh, we're so sad today. Absolutely not. If Allah's your friend, you befriended. I just want to tell you that now. You can say what you want. If Allah is your friend, you are befriended. Okay, uh, psycho-spiritual approach. We just, finished, we just finished whooping boss man with psychological guerrilla warfare and we whooped him and slapped him around all we wanted. And all he could do was holler. Well, he, he don't certainly make a physical noise, but his eyes turned red and you could cook a, 
to boil an egg on his head with a boiling pan because it's so hot. Our mission assists the earth in the rebalance. Kind of like what something Imam Muhammad said in 1976, remake the world. Remake the world. Uh, we're one of the oldest intact uh, revolutionary or evolutionary organizations in the United States. And we're the only one that haven't been slapped upside the head and thrown out as like a piece of garbage. We haven't accepted no money. We haven't accepted no fear mongering or scared of nobody. We was blessed to be able to use uh, all of this instead of as post-traumatic syndrome thinking is post-traumatic growth. I want you to consider everything that has happened to us, we've used it for growth. Everything. All right. Let me see if there's anything else to wrap up. Well, this is old stuff. Best memories were outside of America. That was at a time of exile when I went to prison here, the best memories was not in America, but outside America. So when I was here in jail, I would think about how nice it was in Colombia, how nice it was in Africa. And I always wanted to go back there, not get out and go here, you know. See, there's a few things uh, that's, that's hooked up in that. Have anybody ever heard of Moshe Atunji? What's that? What is it? Huh? No, no, no. That's a place. That's great waters. That's where the, what used to be called Lake Victoria spill over. And it's the headwaters of one of the Niles from that great lake in Africa. Technically, it starts in Africa, and it, when it goes over the falls, that's the beginning of one of the Niles. Now they have the White Nile, and they have the Blue Nile. So Lake Victoria, huh? What country is it in? That's in Tanzania. And Kenya is where the... Uh, the yeah. Okay, anybody ever heard of Machu Picchu? Do you have, can you look up Machu Picchu on your, uh, on the phone? Machu Picchu. M-A-C-C-O-P-I-C-O-A. Okay, Machu Picchu. Uh, Uh, something like M A C C H O P I C H O Macha Picha Picha Macha Okay. Okay, I spell it M A C H O P. Oh, that's okay. Anybody else? Uh, Macha Picha. M A C C. Anyway, Macha Picha. There's a river runs by it called the Urubamba River. That's a long question. That starts in Peru. Now let me explain the other thing. <clears throat> the highest navigatable lake in the world is Lake Titicaca. It's 12,005 Hundred feet up, it borders on Bolivia and Peru. And uh, I took that when I was in Bolivia. I took that, crossed that, and I wound up in Peru. Uh, about uh, three thousand 
uh, about 15,000 feet up, you can take a train ride from Cusco, which used to be the old Inca capital, to Machu Picchu. Does anybody have any pictures of what Machu Picchu looks like? Machu Picchu, it has some pictures. It's a city, uh, it's a city built up in the mountains. You see how it looks? Now you can't see the Urubamba River runs down by that. Okay. So when the Spanish came and they took over, they killed a lot of the nobles and the people in Cusco, the Inca capital at that time. Cusco was the Inca capital. The noble people fled and they ran away to this place and they climbed up this high mountain and they built that city. You see, that city is terraced. That was a city. People used to live there. It's now an archaeological dig. But it's there because the nobles that was defeated by the Spanish ran away from Cusco, the Inca capital, and they ran and they built a city up on top of the mountain. You can't see it from... See, if you're walking on a trail by the river... And you look up, you can't see that city. Because it's up on top of the mountain. (laughs) You see what I mean? So the Spanish used to have teams of people looking for them, going down, everything, and they couldn't find them. They was up there. They were up there. All right. So to a lot of people, that's not a big... uh, the place was rediscovered in 1911, Hiram, something or other. The point I'm making is the pyramids of Egypt, when they talk about the seven wonders of the world, I've visited most of those places. But none of that is more important than the work that we do here. None of it. That's, I'm just making those points. They all have the, the historical realities. We use all of that history for our, to, to help us direct our work and to know what's important in this life. A lot of people don't know what's important and they act real stupid. The man went up and slapped the other man on the TV in front of the whole world. Supposed to be his night of glory and he blew it. Why? Because he couldn't control his lady. And he he felt, no. The ghost of Tupac Shakur was hanging around. Because that lady, his wife, was technically in love with Tupac Shakur, and she felt he was the only man that she ever knew because he came out of the street. And a guy that does movies, what was it, uh, Prince of Bel- Fair Prince of Bel Air? You can't learn nothing there, right? The difference between what Tupac was to those Hollywood actresses is only a piece. The difference between us and all the Negroes. All the Negroes are actors. If they don't, they're not given a part, they don't know what to say. We ain't going for it. If you want to be happy, it is possible. You're going to have to leave boss man behind. It is possible to be happy in this world with all of this dumb fitna. But you got to be locked in straight. You know. In closing, transformation, transcendence, 
or trans- transformation, trans- transition, and transition. Transformation is to change. Make it transition is to move from one place to the other. We move. And transcendence, when you outgrow all the gravitational pulls of everything that's holding you down. Transcendence. You transcend whatever it is you're trying to transcend. You don't get an award for it, a medal. You just know when you've done it. In closing, strategic depth. We were not successful in either stage of our rebellion in the United States because we didn't have strategic depth. We didn't have time to dig deep into the soil of America and to come up with policies that would be called strategic brilliance. What we're doing is called strategic brilliance. It's brilliant because nobody that you know can come before you talking about anything and had their head busted wide open by Negroes and they haven't responded to it because they haven't transcended, they haven't got that far. They ain't got nowhere close. It can't have nothing to do with fear because if, you, if you're laughing and making fun of boss man and everybody else is shaking in their boots about him, well, how could you be afraid of a Negro? You're not afraid of the Negro because every time they wanted to bring one Negro down, they had another Negro attack him, and then they fought that Negro. Uh, we wouldn't even think about doing that, fighting another Negro. That's why I tell everybody to come here, don't go tell no Negro that we said nothing about him. If you did, you have to bring them here so we can explain to them in front of their face what we meant and what we said. So that's why we said don't repeat none of that bunk to nobody. Strategic alliance, strategic ability and strategic capability. So what if people undermine and tie? They at first they think they're getting away with something because they they figure you going boss man and whoop everybody else. Boss man gonna whoop you too, nigga. You ain't gonna be around but three most weeks. That's what they think. And then year after year after year, you're still here. Now, you got to remember now, if you're still here, longevity, right? Protractedness and our clock, morality, ethics, they don't go together in America. You don't get those two together. You're going to have morality. You're going to have ethics. And you're going to have longevity where? In what industry? In politics, you can't do it. In movies, you can't do it. Right? If you say, I'm not going to make no such such kind of movies, that's it, but you won't make no more movies. Then, right? In politics, go tell the people the truth. See how long you're around. Yeah, go ahead. You won't get no longevity. You won't get none. Now, Strategic alliances, we are aligned even with interference. We are aligned with the struggling peoples of the world. We are aligned with them. We either align with them or somebody in there knows certain things about us. They've either been here or been around here or they've mumbled or stumbled and mentioned stuff or took a look and headed on about their business so they would survive. Because their mission that they're on is more important than coming by here and getting their picture took shaking hands with us. Strategic ability and capability, I'm not bragging, but I'm just telling in case anybody's listen, look, it ain't nobody so far. Just read American history. It ain't nobody that can mention all the places that we just mentioned and been there and seen them and worked with people involved in the things at that time. Right? So strategic ability, 
Uh, I visualize we'll be here slapping boss man upside the head or, or rubbing his head. It's going to be bald headed and it's going to be shiny. That won't be long. You notice when things get ready, to get, you get a taste. We have a taste, a feel for the historical process. That's why we say hold it. We don't have, we can't put no guarantee on these times anymore or how long it's going to be. All the strategic alliances we've talked about in the past have all worked out and they're here present today and they have worked out and accomplished what they was meant to accomplish when nobody else was thinking about it. When they were sad because that happened, we said they sad. Okay. Strategic positioning, we'll talk about it again later. But it means what I think I always mean. A setback ain't nothing but a setup for a comeback. So a setback, if you're in the right frame of mind, puts you in a position to make a strike at coming back and doing what you was meant to do all the time. Okay, strategic position. And this is boss man, again, for the thousandth time. Trapped in the headlights of history. If you drive out on the highway every now and then, you look up and you see some eyes pointing at you. That's the eyes of a deer or something like that. And they're hypnotized. They can't move. they trapped in the headlights. Boss man is trapped in the headlights of history. Boy, is he trapped. He is really, he can't do anything right. It's like Latin America, how could I blow it? Well, I could blow it by doing this. One, two, three, four, five. And what does he do? One, two, three, four, five. And he's standing there like that, trapped in the headlights of history. It's like you're on automatic pilot. That means that the things that will bring America down, you don't have to do nothing but stay out of the way. He's already doing it. You cannot increase his level his rate of decline. You can't. I don't know what you could do. What could you do to decrease? What could you do to make America tell all of its allies, don't do this, don't do that, and they don't do it, and they're starving to death, and he's doing it. We don't want y'all to buy no gas, no nothing from what you go, what you bad, right? <laughs> and the dumb Europeans, they doing it for a minute, but they really not doing it. They saying, it. can you imagine what's going to happen or what is happening to the Europeans? They're falling apart. That's what happens when the empire starts cracking. It cracks this way, it cracks that way. America's done. It, I don't see nothing it could do. It could change and do right, but I think it's too late for that. Huh? Well, we're going to do all we can to save the, the good people, but I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I don't think uh, I'm half with you and half not with you. Here's where I'm with you. I'm with you because it's our job. The American people are like people throughout history. They're misled and misguided. And technically it's not their fault that they're misled. Pharaoh had shiny stuff and it caught them. That's what the Quran said. And these people got shiny stuff. Okay. Now, As far as America as a system, we want to rescue the people and not the system. The system that woke in World War II that won, <clears throat> the system that won World War II, the greatest generation. That's what you say is the greatest generation. That's I said that's, that's, that's what the white folks say. They call it the greatest generation. Them white folks that went to World War II. That wasn't in America, that wasn't the greatest generation. 
the greatest generation in America was us from 65 on up, anti-Vietnam, make love, not war. That was the greatest generation. Okay, and World War II? When you're on the way up, you head it up. Look at America. Let's take World War I and World War II before we close. World War I, the people in Europe are fighting from 1914 to 1917 before America comes in. America comes in the war in 1917. So it's three years of war. All of Europe is tired. America comes in, they don't lose nothing. They don't, no cities. Paris, the Germans are 40 miles from Paris. All the death traps in the cities of Europe destroyed. America didn't have none of that. Then they come in fresh. They already got their machinery working. All the weapons that are being built for Europe, the American are building up those weapons and selling them for it. And then they're going to get paid from Europe. They charge in Europe. They pay after the war. In World War II, <clears throat> They call it Thieves Fall Out. It's the same war, war, but now it's a few different players. So they got together the winners of, and they took all the colonies. from. The war was about colonies. Germany didn't have many colonies and France and uh, England had most of the colonies. America had become a colonial power when they went to the Philippines they went to the Virgin Islands and in uh, 1898 in Hawaii when they took all of that. Da, 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 da. So they had become a colonial power, but they didn't say it. <clears throat> World War II started in 1939. A war, America come in almost three years later at the end of World War, at the end of December, December the 7th. Right? And this one, America come in the war. There was no bombs dropped on America. There's only one bomb recorded that landed in America. It was a Japanese balloon bomb that dropped in Oregon somewhere. I don't even know if it exploded. No cities were bombed. When World War II is finished, everybody owes America. America is fresh and ready to go. It develops the Marshall Plan. Anybody with them? And they, it did the Berlin Airlift, 1949. It did. It was rolling. They call that the greatest generation. I call it the dumbest generation. If they done just had World War One. And they made them all the promises and the bonus army and all that. I don't know if anybody remember. The bonus army, look up bonus army. They was parked right down there in Anacostia Park. Bonus army, General MacArthur, the same one that was, he put them all out. They said, you promised us a bonus. We built highways to the sky, but now, brother, can you spare a dime? I don't know if you remember that song. A dime for a cup of coffee. They did all of that. They went over to World War I and whooped the Germans behind. And the ones that whooped them the most, the Negroes got the less. I'm telling you, boy, them Negroes was the most decorated soldiers in World War I. All their medals was from France. Okay. That's why during the 40s and all that, 30s and 40s, you could go... The black people could go to jazz musicians, yeah. Uh, what's the name, Baker? She went over there, all of them. They loved the black people from America because they helped save them. France had lost the whole generation. And when the Negroes got in the war in World War I, they laid waste to, the, to them people. Anyway, let me put it this way. All of those historical facts are things that we study so we know where we are. 
so we have a reasonable idea historically and religiously and what type of warfare we're going to fight psycho spiritual warfare it moved from psychological guerrilla warfare psycho spiritual warfare so you fight your enemy with something it don't have it don't have good strong mind and it definitely don't have no spiritual Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know how to put this. I don't. I don't have no hope in them. Mm -mm. One hired the other, and they all uh, look. Uh, uh, I don't want to answer any questions on uh, people like that. I just don't want to answer any questions. Uh, the reason I don't is I don't want nobody taking nothing out of here unless I say it. I know what to say to them. I've been in meetings with them. I've been all around with them. I don't want nobody to interpret or translate what I say about, uh, you know, uh, you may not believe it, but just like they choose Crump and them other people to be famous lawyers, if they get rid of Malcolm, they choose somebody to take his place. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember him very well. In fact, I know him. I was in L.A. He was a minister in L.A. He used to drive a white Rolls Royce. He used to wear white suits a lot, a little bit, too. Yeah, he used to... Uh, I remember him from years back, way back in the 70s. It wasn't in the six. I remember him from back in, in the middle. Huh? I think Ball's man was behind getting rid of him. Uh, could I have? It wasn't hard. He had people sitting right up there next to him to get rid of him for him. Had the niggas right there in the front living in the living room. Exactly. Yeah, so we could have pulled that off easy. But that hadn't happened to us. We have longevity. We have a record here. I, I don't feel. I got a feeling we're going all the way. Well, I'm thinking that you know the big opportunity is coming up with uh, Biden going to the, going to Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and uh, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be here. Good. 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 Good, good, good. That's my strategic position. Well, if you meet with him, tell him uh, that uh, you're happy to meet the most vicious murderer and most anti-Islamic personality in history. Tell him he got Fahad beat. He got all of them beat. He beat them all. Tell him he, he's good. Or he's bad. Just tell him whatever. That you're happy to meet him. Tell him that from Imam Musa. Well, I've, been, I've been in communication with his father. Hmm? I've been in communication with his father. With Salman? Salman? King Salman. I thought he couldn't. Well, that's, yeah, that's good. I he, thought he, he couldn't hardly king. talk. He's right? the king. He's still the king. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Just to get him to talk or sit up straight is a thing. Okay, anyway, uh, are there any uh, 
Dear brothers, we didn't stray off the record. We said just what Allah wanted us to say. I'm happy about the program today. Are there any questions, any comments? But everything fell into place. Strategic alliance, strategic management under conditions of repression, realigning and reorganizing everything that we're doing, including Tuskia Bil Nafs, purification of self, and Tuskia of goals. We've been into that all the time, both Tuskia Bil Nafs and Tuskia of goals. The Tuskia of goals, purification of goals, prevent you from making any dirty deal with boss man, Zionist, or anybody try to scare you off to them. That's what Tuskia of gold, that's what it means to us. I mean, you won't find it in, in the book on Tuskia of goals. Probably something written on it, but that's what it do for us. That means you can't go wrong because we don't want nothing they got. Are there any questions, any comments? If not, we really, really, really thank you very much. And we are kula kawli hala. Wa staffrullah